Welcome, uh, my name is Thomas Carr and I'm a graduate student at University of Washington. And this is going to be an introductory course to number theory. So what is number theory? Why is it studied? Um, what's so interesting about it? Okay, um, so people will have various different answers to this, but uh, my, my definition would be uh, number theory is, is, uh, is a study of the uh, structure of uh, the integers. Okay, and the integers, so we can denote with a symbol Z. Okay, uh, let's just pick uh, some integers. So uh, let's sort of zoom in on uh, you know, 25, 26, 27. Uh, let's do a few more, 28, 29, etc. Goes on in both directions. Um, okay, well, what do we mean by the structure? Well, certainly uh, 26 is one after 25, one before 27, and you're just going plus one every time. Um, okay, so if that were all that there is to it, then nobody would study number theory. Uh, sounds pretty un uninteresting. Um, but, you know, so far we're, we're only talking about uh, what I'd call the additive structure. So what number follows, you know, 28 follows the number 27, it's, it's, so it's 1 plus 27, and it's 1 before 29. Uh, this is talking about the additive structure, how the numbers are arranged you know, on the number line. Um, but we're missing out on a lot of the structure here. So, so there's a lot more structure here. Um, and the second part of structure would be uh, what I'll call the multiplicative structure. Multiplicative structure. What do I mean by that? Well, now what we can do is sort of take a number, say 25, and sort of zoom in on, you know, what what makes up 25 multiplicatively. Uh, well, 25 is actually a pretty interesting number. It's uh, a square number. It's uh, five times five, or five squared. Okay. Um, aren't any other square numbers here, but 27 is actually rather interesting too. It's a cube. It's three cubed, three times three times three. Um, and, uh, and 29 is also rather interesting. Um, it's, it's an example of a number that you can't break up at all multiplicatively. It's, it's a prime number, it's a prime number. And uh, what is a prime number? So a prime number uh, is a number uh, with exactly two factors, uh, one and itself. Any number greater than one is going to have at least two factors. Uh, prime numbers don't have any other interesting ones uh, except for this one and it's the number itself. Um, okay, so uh, in some sense, prime numbers are perhaps uh, the main object of study in number theory, or one of the main objects of study. Um, why is that, though? So, so the reason has to do with uh, the, fa the fact that the primes sort of generate the multiplicative structure. So let's write this down, actually. So, so prime numbers... Are, you can think of them as the building blocks. So they are the, uh, so the multiplicative building blocks of all numbers, of all numbers. Um, if we think about the additive building blocks, uh, it would really just be the number one. You start with zero and then you add a bunch of ones, you can get to any number you want. Um, the multiplicative building blocks are the primes. Um, so you can factor any number as a product of primes. You can try this with these other numbers too. We already did it with 25 and 27 actually. 25 is a square of a prime, 5. Uh, 26 would be 2 times 13. These are primes. 20 would be 2 times 2 times, uh, so 2 squared times 7. Um, and uh, th there's a rather neat analogy uh, here. So. Uh, between math 
and chemistry. So primes are like atoms. Uh, let's write it down actually. So primes are like uh, atoms. So what, what are primes like two, three, five, seven, eleven, etc. Um, our atoms are uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, etc. Um, and numbers, just any old numbers, are like compounds or molecules. The atoms are just the pure elements. Uh, so, for example, number four, it's like two squared. Uh, that's almost like uh, the molecule H2, <laughs> uh, hydrogen gas. Uh, it's made up of, a, of two hydrogens. Uh, and anything that we see around us uh, is made up of atoms, just various combinations of these basic building blocks. Numbers are the same way. Uh, so, for example, water, H2O, is two hydrogens and one oxygen. Um, I don't know, it's kind of like the number 2 squared times 5, for example, we have, uh, or 20. So it's made up, 20 is made up of two twos and one five. Okay, it's kind of the chemical formula for the number 20. So this is a nice analogy. Um, it's not really perfect because, for example, you could have, um, you could have a molecule like uh, ethanol, it's the simplest one I can think of, so C2H6O. So ethanol has um, two carbons, six hydrogens, one oxygen. Let me try to draw it, actually. Um, so this is ethanol. Um, use red for the oxygen. And they're connected like this. And uh, there are six hydrogens here. So one of them is connected to the O. Uh, there are two hydrogens here. And then there are three hydrogens here. Zethanol. Um, unfortunately, you can also have uh, the oxygen in between the two uh, carbons. Maybe not unfortunately, it's actually rather interesting. Um, you can have the hydrogens here. So this one is uh, dimethyl ether, DME. And uh, you'll notice that these both have the exact same chemical formula. So there are two carbons, there are six hydrogens. Uh, there's one oxygen. Okay, but this, this formula does not determine the uh, compound. Okay. Um, with numbers, you don't really get this. So for example, if I had a number, uh, let's say I had six twos, so two to the six, times, uh, let's say I have two of something, so two threes, and then let's take another prime, five, let's say. Um, this number here, um, it doesn't matter how you combine the six, the, the twos, the threes, and the fives. Um, multiplication is commutative and associative. So it doesn't matter how you group things or what order you combine them. You're always going to get the same number. Uh, so chemistry is not like that. Like you can attach bonds in different ways. Um, but still, this is a really nice analogy to, to kind of have in mind throughout the course. Uh, that primes are sort of the basic atomic building blocks um, of all numbers. Um, okay, so yeah, 29 is rather interesting being a prime. Uh, there are infinitely many primes, actually. I will see a proof of that in a short notice. Um, but uh, what else can we talk about here? So we've looked at the additive structure, pretty boring. Um, we've looked at the multiplicative structure. That's a bit more interesting, but uh, still, like we, we already kind of understand pretty well what's going on there. Um, there's a third kind of structure here. This is really where it gets interesting. So what do I mean by a third kind of structure? Well, we have addition, we have multiplication. What about the interaction between the two? So the interaction between the, uh, the, the two. How does the additive structure interact with the multiplicative structure? And uh, questions um, of this kind can become absurdly complicated, even questions that sound very simple. Um, so I'll give you an example. Actually, let's take the number 28. 28 is really a favorite number of, of a number theorist. Any number theorist will tell you 28 is really a remarkable number. 
Um, I'll show you why. So 28. Let's take um, not just the prime divisors of 28, but let's take all the, the, the divisors of 28, all the factors of 28. Uh, so we'll start with 1, um, 2, uh, 3 is not uh, a, a factor of 28, right? Uh, 4 is, 5 is not, 6 is not because 3 is not. Uh, 7 is, right? 4 times 7. Um, 8 is not, 9 is not. Uh, we can actually simplify our, our search here because... So we already we already know four times seven is twenty eight. So anything bigger than seven, it'll have to be. Uh, if we multiply it by one of these things down here, we'll get twenty eight. So um, two times fourteen will be twenty eight. One times twenty eight will be twenty eight. Let's not include twenty eight for now. Uh, that one's kind of boring. So so we'll just take the proper divisors. So proper divisors means all the divisors excluding the number itself. And um, what are we going to do with these? Let's add them up. So I'm going to add up 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 7 plus 14. What do we get? Uh, we get 3, 7, 14, 28. So if we take the proper divisors of 28 and add them up, we get the number itself. Okay. Um, well, you might not think too much of that, right? Like maybe, maybe this happens all the time. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's not so interesting. Um, but it turns out when you look for more numbers like this, uh, it's pretty hard to actually find them. So there's only one other one less than 100. And it's 6, actually. So 6 is, uh, is 1 plus 2 plus 3. Um, these are all of its proper divisors. Um, and uh, if you take most numbers, uh, this, this is not going to happen at all. So 8, for example is not uh, 1 plus 2 plus 4, which is 7. Uh, so 8 is, 8 is less than 7. Uh, if we take number 12, this is one that has a lot of divisors. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 6 plus, uh, that's it. That's going to be uh, 16. That's bigger than 12. Uh, sorry, I did this the wrong way, didn't I? So 8 is smaller. Uh, or it is larger than uh, sum. Its sum is a uh, is only seven. Uh, you call numbers like this uh, deficient. Uh, uh, divisors add up to less than a number, and you call numbers like this, like twelve, uh, abundant because the divisors sum up to uh, something greater than the number itself. Um, six is an example of a perfect number, and twenty-eight is also a perfect number. And uh, like I said, these are these are these are the only two below 100, six and 28. Um, we write out the first few of these. The ancient Greeks are very interested in these. Um, the next one is actually 496, and the next one after that is uh, 8,128, and then uh, the next one we might see the pattern. So we have one digit, two digit, three digits, four digits. Uh, next one's probably going to be five digits. Um, it's actually 33,550,336. Uh, so it's, it's very large. And we can already see that uh, a number being perfect is actually extremely rare. Okay, there are only five um, up, to, up to here. So, uh, yeah, these are extremely rare. Uh, it's very hard to get exactly the number itself on a nose. Uh, when you sum up its proper divisors. And um, this brings up a really interesting question. So what if we continue this list? Uh, so, so, so the real question is, uh, you know, you know, how many are there? Right? Are there infinitely many? Uh, or do they stop at some point? Uh, is it impossible to, get to keep producing perfect numbers? And uh, the answer to this, is uh, no one has any idea, <laughs> so no one knows. Nobody knows. Um, so it's pretty amazing that such a such a seemingly simple to state problem, uh, just no, nobody has any idea how to solve it. And uh, the reason for that is this problem is actually relating the additive and multiplicative structures of the integers. See, I'm taking divisors, so that's a multiplicative thing, 
right? I'm dividing a number into its parts. And then I'm adding up the divisors, okay? And I want to I want to say something about that sum of the divisors. Is it equal to a number itself? Um, so questions that relate these two kinds of structures uh, can just become extremely complicated. And this is a great example of that. Uh, you know, are there infinitely many perfect numbers? Um, I, so far, I think we found about 51 last time I checked. Uh, so <laughs> um, pe people are constantly searching for more of these as well. Um, okay, uh, well, I tempted to leave it there, but there's, there's one other thing I want to talk about. So we haven't looked at 26 yet. So is there anything interesting about 26? Um, well, it's 2 times 13. That's not so interesting. Um, and I, by, by the way, so when I say, is there anything interesting about it? I don't mean things like, uh, there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. Okay. Like, ugh. Whether that's interesting or not, it, it doesn't have to do with the number 26 itself, right? That's some significant set humans have attached to, to, to the number, uh, even a small subset of humans. Uh, so, uh, I mean, something intrinsic to the number itself. And, um, well, at the very least, uh, there's one thing that's pretty interesting about it, uh, or potentially interesting, right? Um, it's sort of sitting right between a square and a cube. Okay, so 26, let's look at 26. We haven't, haven't looked at that number yet. So 26 uh, is, uh, is one more than a uh, square number, and it's one less than a cube. Okay. Um, well, what's the next natural question to ask, right? <laughs> Is this a very special thing, right? Like perfect numbers, or does this happen all the time, right? Maybe there are infinitely many numbers that are sort of sandwiched between a square and a cube. Um, so yeah, let's ask. Uh, so are there more numbers like twenty-six? Are there more numbers like this? Okay, um, so that's a pretty interesting question. Um, we could try writing out the squares. So let's see, one, four, nine, sixteen. Here, maybe I'll try to write them as if they're on a number line here. Uh, Forty-nine, sixty-four, eighty-one, hundred, etc. One twenty-one. Uh, now we can try to write out the cubes. So one, uh, eight is a cube. Twenty-seven. That's over here. You know, it's twenty-six, so it falls right here in the middle. Twenty-five and twenty-seven. Um, and we can try to notice, like, uh, yeah, how close together are these 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 uh, two types of numbers getting? So, uh, what's the next cube? It'd be four cubed. Um, that's interesting. So, so sixty four is a square and a cube. Um, next one is one twenty five. That's over here somewhere. And uh, you can kind of you know, stare at this uh, list of numbers, extend this out as as long as you want. And uh, you can go pretty high, and you actually won't find another one like twenty six. So. Somehow these lists of numbers can't get too close together. Uh, they can actually get exactly the same, <laughs> and this happens in really many times. Uh, but they, they can't really get, seemingly, they can't get within two of each other um, very often. And uh, so let's say we wanted to actually prove that uh, this can't happen too often. Maybe 26 is the only one. How would we do that? Well, um... The first attempt would be to do something like this. So let's say we have a number like 26 that's one more than a square, but I don't know which square. I'm just going to call it uh, y, let's say. So y is a number that when I square it and I add 1, I get something that is also one less than a cube, but I don't know what that cube is, so I'll just call it x cubed. It's a cube of some number x, arbitrary number. Um, right, so one more than a square is one less than a cube. We have an equation now. Okay, so uh, what are we looking for? We're looking for solutions to this equation where x and y are both integers. So we seek solutions to this equation. Now give us another number like 26. Uh, so we seek solutions uh, where x and y are both integers, okay? 
It's no problem to find solutions to this, by the way, right? We can set X to be literally anything. Um, and then we'll move this, let's move the one over just to make it look a little nicer. Uh, literally any integer and do x cubed minus two and then take the square root of that, right? And then we'll get some value for y. The trouble is that square root is not always gonna be an integer. All right, so we want x and y to both be integers. And um, this is an example of a Diophantine equation. Uh, Diophantine equations is, is basically what, what I just wrote down. So Diophantine equation is some algebraic equation like this one, where we, we, we're really interested in integer solutions or possibly rational solutions. Um, okay, so um, let's just investigate this a little bit further. So um, one other thing you could do here is you could try to graph this equation. So what kind of object is this? It's actually a, uh, this is a curve right here, it's a curve in the xy plane. So say xy, um, what does that curve look like? Well, it's going to include, notice it's going to include the point uh, corresponding to 26, which would be y equals five and x equals three. Three cubed minus two is five squared. Um, so that's this point here. And, uh, and it turns out uh, when you graph this, you're, you're gonna get something that kind of looks like this. It's gonna keep going off. Um, it turns out that this is actually an example of what's called an elliptic curve. This is an elliptic curve. And we have a point on it with integer coordinates, three comma five. Notice that uh, three comma negative five is also a solution to this. Uh, that doesn't give us a new uh, number though. If we plug three comma negative five in, we just get 26 again. Uh, y squared plus one is uh, 26. Um, yeah, this is an example of an elliptic curve. Um, this is one of the things that we're gonna study. And um, the idea is if we can find integer points on this elliptic curve, so points on this curve where both the coordinates are integers, we're gonna get a solution to our Diophantine equation, okay? So really this is a geometric problem. And I'll just say it turns out that, uh, it turns out that this is the only integer point on this elliptic curve. Uh, but that requires um, um, a bit of sophisticated mathematics. Uh, but maybe we'll get to this uh, near the end of, uh, near the end of this, uh, this class. Um, Okay, so that's an example of an elliptic curve. Um, so 26 is actually very interesting. It's the only number that's sandwiched between a square and a cube like this. Um, okay, so, so that gives sort of an overview of the kind of problems that we're, uh, we're interested in. Um, notice again that this problem relates sort of multiplicative structure to additive structure. Okay, so we're taking squares and cubes, but then we're, we're subtracting two, right? Those are, those are hard problems in general. Um, you might have heard of this one. So x, well, let's start with this one. x squared plus y squared equals z squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, but there are integer solutions to this. For example, three, four, five. That's this right triangle, three, four, and five. Um, there are many more. So 5, 12, 13 is an example. 5 squared plus 12 squared is 169, which is 13 squared. Um, 8, 15, 17. I could also say, I could just multiply one of these, 6, 8, 10, but that's not really interesting. It's just a larger version of this triangle. Um, yeah, turns out there are infinitely many of those. Um, however, if I increase the exponent, x cubed plus y cubed equals z squared, uh, z cubed, and I want integer solutions to this, turns out there aren't any. Um, well, that's a bit of a lie, so there's some obvious ones. One, zero, one, <laughs> that works. Um, but if we forbid uh, the, uh, having zero as one of the three numbers, then there aren't any solutions. And it turns out there aren't any for higher values of the exponent as well. 
for any n greater or equal to 3. And s called for Ma's last theorem. This was only proved rather recently um, for Ma's last theorem. So it just gives you an idea that uh, Diophantin equations, um, even very simple looking ones, uh, are incredibly complicated. Uh, the proof of this was uh, over 100 pages and used uh, very sophisticated techniques. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that, that's just an overview of uh, the kinds of problems that, that we're going to be looking at. Um, let, me, let me give you just a quick course outline. So, um, and I'll sign off for, uh, for today. So the course outline, uh, there's going to be three main parts. So the first part, uh, we're going to really investigate primes and divisibility. So the multiplicative structure. Primes and divisibility. Um, and then in part two, we're going to look at uh, modular arithmetic. This is something you might have seen uh, before. Um, but we're going to use modular arithmetic as a tool um, to really study the structure of the integers. So it turns out the structure of the integers, um, especially the way that these additive and multiplicative structures interact, um, is just so complicated that it sometimes helps to just fix a number, for example, like 6, and then look at uh, divisibility by 6. So. Are we at multiple of six? Are we one more than a multiple of six? Or are we two more than a multiple of six? Um, and that's going to be the perspective of modular arithmetic. Um, and then part three is going to be the most exciting uh, part. So we're going to look at Diophantine equations. And we're going to use what we've learned uh, to solve uh, all kinds of Diophantine equations. Um, it's a really beautiful subject, sort of within a subject of number three, um, in that Diophantine equations, you can just make a small change to an equation, uh, for example, change one of these exponents, and uh, you're going to get a completely different equation that looks pretty similar to the original one, but might require completely different techniques. Um, and uh, these often require a lot of creativity to solve as well. Um, so it's going to be really exciting. Um, so but that'll be it for, um, for this introductory lecture. So I'll see you next time.